episode 128, How to Sleep Better. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro-influencer magic. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and this week I'm joined by Riley Jarvis. Riley is the founder and CEO of The Sleep Consultant, an organization that helps CEOs, entrepreneurs, and high performers transform their sleep to significantly boost their productivity and energy levels. Riley started through his own health journey many years ago and discovered that sleep was the missing link that brought everything together. Since then, he's been helping others unlock the biology code and achieve sleep nirvana by getting to the root cause of the issue rather than putting a Band-Aid on the symptoms. Welcome, Riley. Thank you so much, Candice. It's an honor to be on the show today. Uh, this is going to be fun. I have to admit right from the get-go that I sleep horribly, so I'm probably <laughs> going to be asking a lot of personal questions <laughs> awesome yeah <laughs> probably the more personal the more uh however that goes the more personal the more uh people want to know about it exactly exactly so let's yeah. get started uh tell us your unique story how'd you get to where you are yeah it's sort of an interesting one you know so you know i've kind of been on this journey about 10 years or so so about 10 years ago i uh, finished uh, school went to college for finance and you know just kind of followed my dad's footsteps and everything like that and you know i didn't really know what i wanted to do it was kind of like being a doctor kind of going into the business world and uh so i chose finance and, you know the stock markets and the movies and everything and you know that was kind of the reason why and uh you know i was working in the finance industry for private equity investment banking type of places basically if anybody that knows doesn't know what that means it's just like extremely long hours it's kind of like a dog eat dog world your position, there's 10 people like looking to fill your role. So you're very replaceable, very fast. So you have to be on the peak of your game. And so while I was there, I started to, you know, the beginning was fine. And I was always just like a high achiever and everything else like that. And I would say I was about six months into the role, but, and then all of a sudden, I mean, I was probably in my early twenties, maybe 23, 24 at the time. And, uh, you know, my energy started to start to plummet for no reason was starting to drink coffee. Um, not really working anymore. Um, I was getting, you know, horrible, you know, just like fatigue, brain fog. I couldn't do calculations in my head anymore. Um, just all these things that you require on the level of output of this job, but just my faculties weren't there anymore. And I was wondering like, what is going wrong with me? So I went for the first place I knew, which was my general doctor. And he just gave me a couple of things to try. And, you know, I just do, you know, that more water, just basic things, more sunlight exercise. Wasn't working, went down the rabbit hole, tons of specialists, you know, probably saw like a dozen specialists at least. Some of the blood work was good and just different things. And it was finally when I saw a um, gastroenterologist who specializes in the gut, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. It was, which is basically like inflammation of the gut and everything. So that was kind of cool to know because it was like, oh, well, now we can actually put a label to this and see what's going on. But it's around that same time that my health just continued to deteriorate as well. So like I was starting to lose weight. Uh, I can notice some of my hair was thinning. Um, I have some pictures that I show in presentations I give. Like I was just not healthy. And I, you know, it was just sometimes hospital visits and, you know, the medication that they were giving me, the side effects were actually making me feel worse. And this is to the point where I was bedridden and I could not get out of bed. So what I basically had to do. I was forced to quit my job, um, fell into a pile of debt. Um, doctors can't really help me. So I kind of fell into a deep depression at the time. And, you know, it's kind of at this point of triumph, you know, where a lot of health coaches start, where it's like, okay, I have to take health into my own hands with my, with my back up against the wall. So it was at this point that I was just basically taking like part-time jobs at the time, you know, sales jobs, whatever I could do to just pay the bills. And in all my spare time for hours a day, I was just doing hours upon hours of research, you know, understanding the body like how does it work crohn's autoimmunity autoimmunity is sort of a tricky one because it's not like you just get a cut and it's gone and autoimmunity like affects your entire body and it's a tricky one for a lot of people that deal with for years thankfully you know crohn's people are pulling out a bag and can actually be lethal for some but i wasn't at that point it was bad but it was just affecting my day-to-day -day life and so it was at that point where it's just studying honestly for about four to six hours a day trying to mastermind with other people spending you know going into more debt just tens of thousands of dollars on doctors on supplements and all these different things. And each month I would try certain categories. So one month I might try exercise. One month I might try, you know, like diet. One month I might try sleep. And when I got to that sleep month, that's when everything started to improve drastically. And it kind of, you know, it sort of surprised me because one thing I started to notice was it was, um, I always saw sleep as this thing where you just close your eyes, you open your eyes and you just get on with it. And, you know, if we don't sleep well, we just drink a coffee and we get on with it. If that was just my mentality. It was just, why would I be unconscious and unproductive when I could sleep less and be more productive? But it was really, you know, miraculous to me because all of a sudden 
I started to feel better. I was gaining weight again. The blood tests were showing like everything was improving, like in just how I was feeling. So I was like, huh, there's something, you know, into this. So I just went deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole. And then, uh, you know, diet, lifestyle, exercise, and all these other factors were obviously a factor like sleep goes into that and, you know, all these other things go into better sleep, but your body has this amazing inner healing mechanism. When you give it the right inputs, it's going to give you the right outputs. And so it was at that point where everything just started to get so much better. And, you know, five years after that, um, went back to the doctors, doctors said Crohn's was in 100% complete remission. They didn't know why it is kind of funny. Like they just started scratching their heads and, you know, it's just, it, I talked to other people about this sometimes similar experiences kind of going more of that natural route. Um, you know, and it was just sort of at that point where I started helping other people with their sleep now. And it wasn't for people who were in a disease state. That was me. And I like to show that as an example of what you can achieve, but these are for people who, you know, they're just the average people who are looking to improve their sleep for their performance, their productivity, their relationships, and all these other things and just general well-being. And we all sleep anyway. So compared to if you have to follow this really strict diet, or if you have to, you know, drag your butt to the gym and do an intense workout, we're all sleeping anyway. So, you know, it's called Pareto's principle where you can get 80% of the results with 20% of the work. And that's one thing with sleep is if we can just make a custom, a few custom tweaks to that, it's just amazing how much better you can feel. I'm kind of going on a rant here, but I'll just give a couple quick examples and we can go deeper later on. You know, one, for example, is I've had clients who had injuries, like seeing specialists for years, like whether it's their shoulder or something else, and they just don't have any relief in sight. They're on pain medication all the time. And when we improve their sleep, when we, you know, our body releases specific recovery hormones while we sleep, and we don't tap into that unless we get specific REM and deep sleep. And so with these clients, they ended up, you know, all these problems they were having within like a month, they just didn't have pain anymore. Like it completely went away. And so you have things like that. You have people where they can shorten at like an eight hour workday down to five hours because their productivity is so much more on point. Uh, people who are pre-diabetic, not diabetic anymore, you know, losing weight, like 60 pounds in six months or something like that, like just still safe, but, you know, just by improving sleep and everything else is the same. It's amazing. So anyway, I started helping people, you know, it was sort of friends, friends of friends kind of made a local name for myself. And that's where I, you know, was, you know, getting just testimonials, great results for clients. And it was just at this point where I thought, you know, I could really take this international. So that's what it is now. And that's where I help people with their sleep internationally. And how I do that is I like to test, not guess. So you typically see like those eight things, like the checklist of the eight things to do blackout, like blackout your bedroom, uh, blue light, um, avoid electronics, uh, melatonin, if you need it, they're very basic. And a lot of people that I work with, they do these basic things already, but it's just still not working. And so what I like to do is take a sniper like approach where I actually send lab test kits to people's houses and we'll look at like their genetics, their hormones, um, their gut, like parasites, uh, their brain neurotransmitters. And it can really give a window looking under the hood of their biology and it can really pinpoint, like, instead of just taking all these things, and not knowing why we can create a customized approach. And it's amazing. Like somebody struggling for 20 years within like a week, sorry, not a week, four weeks to eight weeks. It's like 50 to 70% improvement sometimes. Like it's absolutely insane what you can do with some of that. And then with that energy, better relationships and everything else. So, you know, I, I love, you know, there's a guy named Matthew Walker. He's been on Joe Rogan podcast and other things. He has a book, Why We Sleep, but he's kind of brought this sleep to light. He's a professor at uh, Stanford University, I believe. And he kind of brings this childlike wonder to sleep because sleep, they really don't understand. I mean, they're really in, an, in its infancy stages. So anytime... You know, the more you, you know about sleep, the less you, you, you know, you just see how deep the rabbit hole can go with this stuff. So it's just, it's so fascinating to talk about it every single day and just seeing the new scientific literature that's coming out about it. So yeah, that's everything in a nutshell. I really like to take a scientific approach, improve um, everything, just, um, you know, just deep down the biology, but you know, everything's good too. Sometimes people just need a couple tweaks, change their environment around and uh, that's enough to do well. I like the, that approach. It's a holistic thing. It's my acupuncturist many years ago told me that melatonin could cause psychosis. So anytime someone says that they're taking melatonin, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, hmm. okay. So I want to, I want to backpedal for a little bit because you said coffee that you were drinking coffee. Um, now you're going to tell me if you tell me that I have to stop drinking coffee, I'm going to be like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> because I enjoy the, um, the ritual of coffee, 
right? I enjoy, yes, absolutely. I enjoy the heat in the mug. I enjoyed put, putting the yeah. right amount of creamer so that the colors, the coffee is the right color. I enjoy the smell, f- the smell of it. And the, ri- and it may take me two hours to drink one cup of coffee, but I have this absolutely. handy dandy, um, coffee mug warmer on my desk. So my coffee oh, never gets cool. cold because I'm my warmer just keeps it warm. But you know, I just, it's wow. this whole ritual and it's, I, I don't think I'm drinking it for the caffeine. I'm drinking it for the, for the ritual, for the ritual. And absolutely. You know, sure. some days I might drink two cups. Some days I might drink four cups. Uh, I never drink just one cup, <laughs> but again, <laughs> it could take, if I'm drinking two cups of coffee, I could get that first cup of coffee at six o'clock in the morning and still be drinking that first cup of coffee at 10. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm just, sipping on it, enjoying the smell. I, the, the smell comes off the thing, you know, it's just this ritual for me. So please tell me I don't have to stop drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody asks that question. It's so funny because that's a staple for a morning routine, right? Like it's what gets our day started. If we don't drink coffee, we're going to be a walking zombie throughout the day. So I always tell people it's all about relative to you. And it's all about, if you want to make a change, it's about baby stepping. in. so I never do anything in cold Turkey. I mean, I do work with the freaks who enjoy doing that, but uh, you know, for the majority of us, we don't do that. And so to answer your question is no, you don't have to quit coffee at all. And it all depends, you know, the best way to do it is to look at these lab tests and to see really like how much stress is your body under? Because if you have, if you drink coffee, coffee is a stress on our body and increases our cortisol, increases our adrenaline, which also makes us feel more awake and alert. But if our body is in a state where it's always burnt out and we actually rely on coffee, on coffee to get through the day, then it's actually going to be putting something known as our adrenal glands, but just also our hormonal system into overdrive. And if our adrenal, if our hormonal system is already tanked, meaning if our adrenal glands aren't producing sufficient output, for example, of cortisol or some of these hormones as it is, we're basically, you know, adding fuel to the fire of really burning out our body and burning the candle from both ends. And that's to the point sometimes where people will drink, you know, four coffees in a day, but they still don't feel anything. And the reason is a lot of the time it's because your body's not having that same response to the co- to the caffeine. And that's where you get really nasty withdrawals. But so that's the extreme end, but you don't have to quit coffee. And so what I usually like to say is it's all about the caffeine intake. So you can definitely do decaf coffee, but for some people who like the caffeine, it definitely gives them a, a kickstart, right? But decaf is just a good way to do it because you get the smell, the aroma, the taste, the ritual and everything else that you would like. But at the same time, there's many different coffee alternatives that actually have less coffee and less caffeine inside of it. So for example, there's a brand called four Sigmatic and four Sigmatic is uh, it's kind of like a mushroom powder. It's very good for you. Actually. It has like lion's mane and chaga and some of these other, but it, it has some caffeine, but just a little less. So it's kind of like the gateway. If you, if you're looking to quit it completely. So for example, like in one cup of coffee, you might have like 100 to 150 milligrams um, of caffeine inside of it. And then you can go to, you know, like 50 milligrams of coffee and then, you know, down to zero milligrams of coffee. It's kind of like when somebody goes to the doctor, you know, if they're depressed and they have antidepressants and they want to get off of it, they don't just quit all of a sudden. They slowly taper off so they don't get those side effects. So it's kind of a similar mechanism there. So those are kind of easy ways to do it. But it's what I like to say for people, it's really start to feel your body. A lot, a lot of people sometimes will see me as, someone bit somebody with all the answers and as much as I would love to be, it, it's really about feeling your own body. And you, it's really a skill set and you start to get good at this stuff. Like if you wake up and you think, how much coffee do I need? Like I've just been doing this for so many years, just through practice alone that if I'll, I'll know, for example, like I've got maybe 15 supplements on my, on my fridge and I'll just, I'll scan them. I'll feel like, you know, I'm kind of feeling like a little bit of this today. It'll kind of be like a buffet. And it's sort of similar to coffee. When you have that sensitivity to your body, you'll know how much it needs and and at the right time. And one last thing I'll give is something that's very practical and useful is you don't want to drink coffee until 90 minutes when you first wake up. Um, Not the, I mean, preferably. And the reason for this is when we wake up, our cortisol levels are at their highest peak and their lowest before we go to bed. And that's why we feel sleepy. Cortisol can make us like, it's good. It has a a bad reputation sometimes because it's related to stress, but it's actually good for us and it gives us energy. If we have coffee, as soon as we get up first thing in the morning, when our cortisol is at at its highest peak, our cortisol can't really go any higher. Our body isn't so sufficient for it, or at least it'll be sort of artificial. So what we want to do is we kind of want to ride this curve. And for anybody that's, that's just listening to this kind of think of it as sort of a roller coaster going up. And as it starts to tip over before cortisol levels start to go down in the day, and this is usually about 90 minutes after we wake up, we want to capture sort of this peak and have our coffee then when our cortisol starts to dip. And so then we can start to increase it again. And what that, so what does that do? And what would that allow you to do is allow your coffee to run 
uh, for longer uh, throughout the day. So you won't get as much of a crash in the morning and you'll actually be able to sustain that first cup of coffee for probably an additional two, three or four hours um, throughout the day as well. So that's one way to do it. Also, when we, when we first wake up, uh, we lose one liter of water from our breath alone when we sleep. And so if we're going right to coffee, which is a diuretic, it's actually going to dehydrate us more. Now water is so important for how we think, for how we feel. And so for a lot of people, they're just tired because they're dehydrated and their body's dehydrated, but, you know, and they're using coffee to compensate for that. But if we can, you know, first wake up, drink one liter of water, some pink Himalayan seeds, two salts inside of there for electrolytes, minerals, potassium, sodium. And then after that, we have our first cup of coffee. That's a really good way to do it. And with a lot of the clients that I work with, that's, you know, that's an awesome way. Another good one people can look up is called Bulletproof Coffee. All that is, is when we just combine fat with our coffee. So for example, whether it's butter, ghee, with something known as MCT oil, it actually slow releases that caffeine over the day. So we don't have as much of a crash and it's actually not as taxing on our hormonal system as well. Holy crap. You just gave me a lot of information. I'm going to go backwards for a little bit. Four Sigmatic is, I Googled it while you're talking, is the word <laughs> four is in the number four and then sigmatic.com. They'll be linked to that in the show notes. And then yeah. um, you said we should drink a liter of water when we wake up for Americans. That's four glasses of water. So that's 32 ounces of water, four glasses exactly. of water. That's how much you lose yeah. when you sleep. That's yeah, a lot exactly. of water. It's a lot of water. Yeah. And you know, for somebody to drink that much water in the morning can be pretty tough. So all I say is, you know, you don't have to go from zero to hundred, just drink one cup of water and see how you feel and just slowly, you know, work your way up. But I would say the most important time to consume water is when you first wake up for sure. Wow. That's, that's, a, that's if, okay. You guys can stop listening now. Cause that's the best tip ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a huge proponent of drinking water and I know I don't drink enough, but I'm constantly telling mm. people to drink more water. Well, okay. So let's talk about those recovery hormones because uh, you said that you can only get them uh, when you're in REM. So let's get to REM. How do we get there? And what's yeah, this really Nirvana thing? What, I mean, what's this is Nirvana REM. Is that what you're talking about? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just kind of a cool little term that I came up with sleep Nirvana. And it's kind of like an end goal that I like to work with a lot of people. And what that is, is the ability to fall asleep within 15 minutes. Cause a lot of people have, you know, struggle going to sleep. So ability to go to sleep within 15 minutes, sleep uninterrupted for seven to nine hours. And this is like not going to the bathroom or anything like that. And then waking up with an abundance of energy where you do not need to take any stimulants. So that's the end goal here. So everything I talk about is this is really what we're trying to achieve um, with all this here. And so, you know, if you can't fall asleep or if you're waking up in the middle of the night, or if you wake up and you just feel groggy and you rely on caffeine, then there's probably something happening that you could probably tweak that would really start improving a lot of these things um, in the first place. All right. Well, that gets, gets us to the, what are those things? What are those things that we can tweak? From the, really I mean, okay, well, this, but I want to clarify though, that I understand yeah. that without um, our individual lab work, you can't die. You, I mean, you can't diagnose anybody anyway. You're not a medical professional, but yes, you can, exactly. without, without the lab work, you're not going to be able to pinpoint what's wrong with Joe over there or Sally over there, but you can give some general sure. broad uh, advice yeah, exactly. on how to get to sleep and sleep better. Yep. Yeah, I- Absolutely. And always check it with, with your practitioner with any of these things. You know, you just never know what's happening with your health and biology. So yeah, just small disclaimer there. So how do we do it? And there's a lot of things that we can do. And just, just touch on your point, what you're saying with, you know, people who are injured with that hormone release, it's called human growth hormone, HGH. Um, people, when we're able to release this and recover our body while we sleep, that's where, you know, a lot of these um, injuries just seem to start to go away. I mean, not always, but for a good case of people I work with, it's the case. And so there's two different forms of sleep that we have. I mean, sleep is very complex, but just to simplify it, there's deep sleep and we have REM sleep. And we can think of deep sleep as more of our body, restoring our body, recovering our body. And we can think of REM sleep as more of recovering our mind. And so in the first half of our sleep cycle, so let's say we're sleeping about eight hours, our sleep runs in 90 minute sleep cycles. So when we first put our head on our pillow, we'll go from light sleep to deeper sleep, to REM sleep, to deep sleep. And then it kind of comes back up again and we'll do another wave. And so we, in order to have sufficient sleep and to feel great the next day, we want to have four to five cycles of these full sleep patterns, four to five um, cycles of 90 minutes. And so if we're waking up in the middle of the night, we are not, we're going to be interfering with those deep sleep cycles. And that's where, you know, when you really look into this stuff, that's kind of the cause of what's making you feel groggy at the end of the day. Um, so what can you do about it? Well, there's a lot of things. It's all about the evening routine, the morning routine, and kind of what you do throughout the day. 
what causes, so let's start with the beginning. Most getting to sleep, most people can't sleep. Overthinking is the most common cause for people not being able to sleep. And I think it's something like, you know, 60, 60 something percent or something like that. Like something by a mar my wide margin. And this is how they rate themselves. They may not know their hormone system's tax or something else. This is just how they self-assess. And so getting to sleep overthinking, I would say for sure is the biggest one. And so it's like, how do we calm the monkey mind down? It's because, you know, we really can't control our thoughts. So what do we do about it? So there's a lot of things that we can do about it. We can use supplements for, you know, temporary relief. We can do meditation. We can do something known as binaural beats. So I'll go into some, I'm just going to make it super practical. People can use it on their phone and just quick tips and tools. One is called brain.fm and it's an application on your iPhone or Android. You can get it from the Apple store or the Google play store. And what it basically does is you wear headphones um, while your phone's connected to this app. And I think it's like three bucks a month, but it's amazing. It's more than worth the investment. And they have different modes on side of it. You're basically listening to these, you know, uh, frequencies, sounds, but it feels really good. And you can listen for 10 minutes to 30 minutes to 60 minutes and even longer if you choose to. And what it does is send frequencies into your brain to push your brain into a state of focus, of creativity, of sleep, of relaxation, or really whatever you want. So a lot of people put on the relaxation one or the sleep one before bed. It's usually lights out with the middle of five, five or 10 minutes if they were having a lot of stress before bed. So that's kind of one part there. And why we can't get to sleep sometimes is it's either stress in our mind or stress in our body. And this is where the self-awareness comes from, because we can identify, okay, is it me overthinking or does my body just feel stressed? Like I'm wired, but tired. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm moving around at nighttime. Um, if it's more of your body than, you know, doing something like a meditation, breathing through your nose, like four seconds, four to six seconds through the nose, holding it for four to six seconds, and then breathing out through the mouth. Um, it's super simple. And a lot of people don't do it just because it is simplistic. I mean, I was the same way, um, but that's a really good way to do it. Also two guided meditation. So on YouTube, there's so many free resources because it, it's really about getting less into the mind and more into the body. And if we can get more into our body, there's just less, you know, garbage going on in our mind to handle. So that's kind of a shortcut to it. Just always think, get into the body, get into the body. So whatever that looks like for some people, it's yoga. For some people, it is, you know, doing a guided meditation and feeling the body as they breathe in with each, with each breath and doing that for about 20 minutes. I mean, that's really game changer and the science really backs it up. Um, one of my favorite YouTube videos, the meditation is about 20 minutes. It's called the honest guys. And I forget the, uh, what it's called, but base it's kind of an, um, an icon of a wave coming through people that have used it, that I've suggested it to, they've, they've just felt found that to be the most relaxing. So it's, um, definitely a good one to check out. And then, you know, in terms of supplements that you can try, um, supplements are good. They, you don't, you know, you don't, like you said about melatonin, you want to use it as they can be abandoned at the end of the day and you don't want to use it as a crutch to your you know to your poor sleep because ideally we wouldn't need to use any of this if our body was functioning as it should so a couple of them are the following so you can use melatonin and again check with your doctor with all these supplements uh between one and three milligrams is usually a good a good starting point to use anything more than that sometimes your body can build up a tolerance melatonin is very good too like it's a it's a master antioxidant and other things but like you said it can induce you know, bad things for some people and bad symptoms and side effects. So this is where, you know, feeling your body is best. Another supplement to help you relax before bed is something known as L-theanine. L-theanine is a natural supplement that's actually naturally occurring in green tea. And this will actually really help us relax. Um, another one is uh, magnesium. We can use one known as magnesium glycinate, or we can use one known as magnesium threonate. Magnesium threonate is great for the mind because it passes the blood brain barrier easiest. And as a result, you know, people with PTSD have tried this stuff and, you know, it's really changed them overnight. Sometimes um, it's an amazing one too. some of these great nutrients. So those are, I could, I could definitely say more, but also take a look at something known for supplements called adaptogens. So rhodiola is one or no, one known as ashwagandha. Um, those are a little bit hard to spell, but uh, you know, they're, they're pretty well known now compared to the early years that I was doing this, but they're basically called adaptogens. So people can look up online, some of those, and that's kind of more for your body stress and stuff like that. So great tools to start with. So that's getting to sleep. Staying asleep though, is a little bit more complex for some people. And it depends. It is, is it because you're waking up to go to the bathroom? Is it because you're having bad dreams or your mind is just processing so much that it causes you to wake up? Is it because your body is actually stressed and it's causing cortisol spikes? Is it because you have like a blood sugar spike um, in the middle of the night, which causes you to wake up? So it could be all these things, but I'll, I'll just say, you know, just general things that people can do 
to, to avoid waking up in the middle of the night. One is waiting at least four to five hours before we, um, of our last meal. So having, let's say we go to bed at 10, having our last meal about five, 6 PM latest. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, it can affect our body by temperature. It's processing all this food, um, it affects blood sugar and things like that. If you, a lot of people notice that they have a sugary dessert before they go to bed, it really spikes their blood sugar. And this is going to cause their body to wake up because it's just riding this blood sugar roller coaster, cold room environment. You can also do, so for a cold, cold room environment, you can also do a hot bath, like an Epsom salt bath before bed or like a warm shower. That's another really good one you can do. Um, you know, I would say those are really good things to just avoid. Another really good one is um, writing on a journal, all your thoughts before you go to bed and just doing a brain dump about one hour before bed. It's a simple one, but it's a great one because if our brain is just processing so much uh, while we sleep, it's just, it's too much for it to handle sometimes. So if we could do that brain dump and kind of leave our brain in a blank slate, then that can um, really improve people's sleep as well. Wow. Okay. And then what about waking up? And then when we wake up is so to have energy, when we first wake up, it's kind of, if we do all the previous things that I just mentioned, right, the chances are we're going to wake up with a bunch of energy. If, but when we wake up, it's that morning routine I talked about. So, you know, waiting on that coffee, you can fast if you want and not eat. That's a good option too. Um, but, you know, having that first liter of water first thing in the morning and also, um, you know, pink Himalayan sea salt with some water. That's a really good way to start the day. That putting a little bit of Himalayan sea salt in your water makes it taste so good too. That's it does. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. It just, it, it adds yeah. those, I don't know. It just adds that. It's like drinking fancy bottled water. Only it only costs, a, <laughs> it only costs, you know, yeah. a grain of salt. <laughs> you, yeah. you don't have to put a <laughs> lot. Really you don't have to put yeah. a lot. Just a little bit goes a long way. So we've talked about why sleep is important. And we've talked about uh, what happens when people don't sleep well, and we've given some steps to improve sleep. What else do people need to know? Other things people can do is, you know, really just getting started with sleep. I feel like, you know, the biggest hurdle for people to sleep better is, well, I don't have time for that. And it seems so basic, but I just think it's important to touch on is no matter what your schedule is, like I said, in the beginning, we're all sleeping anyway. So if you can just, you know, maybe one day it's just reducing the bedroom environment temperature of your room to, you know, just making it cooler, reducing some of the blue light that's coming into your bedroom, um, you know, your, your, your pre-bed ritual routine, just, you know, doing this and just introducing one thing at a time and just seeing how you feel. And if you can journal each of these things, like just try one thing and just write about it for a week and see how it is. And you kind of become like a scientist because you have a hypothesis. Like, um, if I try this thing, let's see how I respond. And then you can see how you respond and then you can look back at it like, Oh, this thing worked. Oh, this thing didn't work. And that's how you can get good really fast instead of just throwing everything at the wall and not knowing why, because everything is just all over the place. So that's kind of one thing I would say, and, you know, it's just everything I'd mentioned is a really good, great starting place to get started. But once you improve your sleep, so many things improve inside of your life. So even if you had the same diet, even if you had the same exercise regime, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to have better well-being, if you want better relationships, really just optimizing this deep sleep in this REM sleep as much as possible. And it seem, seems complex, but just those practical things that I gave you, that will automatically improve a lot of these things that um, I mentioned at the same time. And so we have more of that deep net room sleep too. That tip of just doing one thing at a time is it's true for everything. I mean, it, even, it, even something like social media marketing, if you're social media marketing, don't try all the social medias, try one channel at a time. You know, if you're thinking about changing your messaging, don't change all your messaging, just add a little bit to see what kind of shift it makes, you know, don't it just make those little tiny incremental steps a, a minute, a, a minute, an hour is made up of 60 minutes and a minute is made up of 60 seconds. And a second is made up of infinitesimal nanoseconds, right? So little tiny incremental steps can lead you to a bigger thing. And it's not, uh, there are people who can do cold Turkey. My husband, cold Turkey quit smoking, right? cold turkey. There's some people who can do it, but most of us have to do things in little tiny incremental steps. So Riley is spot on with that one thing at a time. And I love that you, you suggest the journaling it for a week. So for a week, I'm going to wake up and not drink coffee. I'm going to drink a liter of water, which is 32 ounces. <laughs> I'm going to drink for, for Americans. It's 32 ounces, I'm going to drink, which is eight glasses of water or four glasses of water. So you're going to drink four glasses of water when you wake up in the morning before you have your coffee. Don't start with four glasses of water. If you don't drink any water right now, start with one, right? 
right? So this is all really good advice. Really, really good advice. I want to go back to your journey and you, because you took this thing that was you, you had your career and then you had your Crohn's disease and you and you figured out that sleep was the problem. And then you turned sleep coaching into your career. So yeah. talk about how you took something that was frustrating for you and uh, that, that you had done and you turned it into a career. Talk about that journey. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been such an inspiring one, you know, looking back, I guess any entrepreneur that, you know, truly makes it, I think they say, you know, something like 80% of businesses after five years potentially fail. But I think like, yeah, I'd agree to that is true. But if you focus on the right thing, if you talk to the right people, I think it's inevitable, inevitable to become successful inside of it. And I felt like that was, you know, really the case for me, because I was just always investing in coaches, and I was always investing in, you know, resources. And I always trusted that I put my ego aside a lot of the time. And I trusted that people knew better than me because they did it before. And it allowed me to not make those same mistakes myself. Um, I would say, though, just from like a motivation standpoint, just first seeing, the, you know, I, first seeing the, seeing the first few transformations in clients really stuck with me. And, you know, looking back, those are some of my favorite because it was taking something that I wasn't necessarily confident in. I knew it worked for me, but a ba- being able to apply it in people and they had seen those real time changes that, that really starts to build up your confidence early on. And then, you know, just after time, I just, you know, I'm so confident how just the results that some people can see with some of this stuff. And that's where that can bleed through when people were once where I was and they didn't believe that. So it could be that, that answer. And then to be able to show that too. And so I'd say that was really a big point that kept me moving forward with it because yeah, I was sort of in this limbo of like, okay, do I take the risk of my own business? Because obviously you have family too. That's like, well, you follow a nine to five career path and, you know, so you're always second guessing yourself, but the more you stick on this path, the more it becomes this tangible reality where it's like, this is actually turning into something that's beyond me. And I'm not just doing it like for me, for me be, to be able to help people and change people's lives. That's way bigger than me going back to a nine to five job. And I think if you're looking at the risk from that point of view, I would say it's more than worth it. You know, in finance, looking at spreadsheets, you know, calculating numbers, doing graphs and everything. I mean, it's, it's great for some people. And I, you know, I was a numbers guy in the beginning, but I just got so much more out of helping people, networking with people, you know, and just building friendships with people after they, you know, go through some of the one-on-one working with me. Um, You know, I think that was really the thing that brought it together uh, from a motivation standpoint. In terms of business strategy, though, would you like me to touch on some of that? Oh, absolutely. Okay, cool. So business strategy was really interesting because when I first started with sleep, so for me, for, for business point of view is I was, you know, it wasn't the sleep consultant until a few years after my beginning, my, my journey started. And in the beginning stages, I was just helping out people one-on-one with their sleep and everything else, but I truly wanted to make a business out of it. And so I first started into drop shipping. And so I was sourcing products from China, kind of sleep products, like sleep masks. I had like, you know, something like 50, 70 products inside of there. And it became pretty successful. Um, but I just wasn't have that, having that one-on-one interaction that I did. And, you know, the, the mistake I made was I should have just focused on one product instead of, you know, mass appealing to all these different ones, thinking I would just, you know, jack of all trades, but not, not master of one. So that was a business lesson inside of there. Once I wanted to, I sort of sold off that store and then I really pursued this one-on-one um, sleep coaching with a lot of people. And, you know, I invested in a lot of different people and I followed a lot of different people, for example, like um, Sam Ovens was a big one, Ty Lopez was a big one, Gary Vaynerchuk back in the day, um, Alex, Alex Becker um, was a really big one. And just hearing what they said when it comes to a consulting based business. And what I saw with consulting, you know, helping people on a one-on-one basis was a lot of people were in it to try and make a quick buck. And, you know, everyone seems to be a coach nowadays. And it was sort of the same case back then. And I kind of anticipated that, you know, you would just have like an 18 year old who was a relationship coach. It was like, how many relationships have you been in? You know what I mean? So um, I found that my sleep knowledge and my sleep, you know, skill set of everything that I learned through my own journey you know, investing tens of thousands in my own education afterwards as well, getting certifications and for their education. It was like, I have to help people here. So that's where I focus on the quality of the business. But what I realized shortly thereafter was my marketing was falling behind. I just thought, well, if I focus on the product quality, the service quality, well, things are just going to, you know, sort themselves out, which is true because you get referrals, a good thing, but it wasn't enough. So this is where I started my Facebook profile, my LinkedIn profile, 
got the podcasting going thing. So providing people on my website, like when they go to it with a free lead magnet, now I can inform them more about sleep through constant emails and just providing value, sometimes offering if they want to do one-on-one consult with me, but you know, the primary goal is to provide that value first and then expect nothing in return. And that's carried me really far, to be honest. And then once you your LinkedIn and your Facebook profile, you know, there's sales funnels, you can do video training, Facebook groups, um, and stuff like that, but just making ongoing social media posts, I think is very important. Video is also an important attribute now. Um, but I'm always learning new things now when it comes to that game. But back then, what really sort of set me apart was one, I picked something that was blue ocean, meaning that nobody was really inside of that space. It was just sort of me. So I basically had the whole industry to myself in a way, especially through the lens of productivity performance with some of the high performance that I worked with. And so I really just ran with it. And every person I talked to, it was like, wow, I've never heard of this before. Like, this is so amazing. And sometimes when I go into a podcast, you know, where people may struggle to get onto the show for me sometimes, but not to, not to brag, but it's almost instant because people are like, yeah, sleep. Like I've never heard about sleep before. Let's hear about it. And, you know, just diving down that rabbit hole. And again, it's just sort of something that's untouched, at least for now. And that's where I've been able to, you know, really succeed. So I would say for a lot of people, if you can choose a strategy, that's kind of blue ocean, and you just niche and you niche and you niche into one specific thing that you can truly dominate, then, you know, you, you could, when you're a specialist, you can charge more for those and, you know, the sky's the limit with all that. So that's really one getting your name out there. It's about branding. It's about everything else. But I would say, you know, in the, in the beginning stages, getting your first customers, getting, and just working nonstop to get them the best results possible to get a video testimonial or written testimonial, doing an interview with them. Now you can use it for your social media and all these other things that go into it. And really testimonials, when it comes down to marketing, I have found have probably sold the best. Um, it's one thing when you say how good you are, but when other people say how good you are, then it's, it's much different. So my husband and I started a custom furniture business in 1999 and the people listening to the podcast have heard this story over and over again, but it's worth repeating because it's worth repeating. Uh, in 2017, we, re- we decided to retire. And then in 20, I don't know, 19, my husband got bored. And so we decided that we were going to do the furniture again, but on a very limited basis, very, very small. So I had to rebuild our website because I had let it go because I didn't think we were going to do furniture anymore. And the very mm-hmm. first page that I rebuilt on our website was the testimonials page. Uh, that is so. how important testimonials are. They are, they were my very top priority. Yeah. And Perfect. last week I sold a bed to a woman and she said, based on your testimonials, I figured you guys did a really good job. That's not awesome. an exact quote, but that's, you know, the, the crux of what she said. So they yeah. really, people really do look at your testimonials listener. Yeah. If you're not <laughs> harvesting testimonials, you need to start doing it now. And we can have a whole nother conversation about that, that in another, another time. Um, I was going to make a snarky comment about something. I can't remember what it was, though. Hey, when that happens, you were talking yeah, about something. <laughs> I wanted to talk. Moment, kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it was. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it was. Okay, this is really interesting. This is all really good. Um, oh, I remember what it was. So you did finance yeah. before. You were a number cruncher. And I could argue that you were still a number cruncher because you take a very scientific approach to the way that you help people. Yeah, I guess you could say that too, right? <laughs> so you, you've you taken a skill set that you had in your previous life and you've applied it yeah. to um, what you're yeah. doing now, which is what I did too. Before, before my husband and I had our own business, I worked, um, I worked in the outdoor industry. I was in a, a buyer and I took everything that I knew about from the buyer's angle. And I put it, uh, put all that knowledge together to create a product offering that retail stores would be interested in. So even though oh. it, I went from outdoor apparel and sporting goods to custom furniture, I still used the same uh, thought process. You know, I, I looked at churn, mm-hmm. I, I looked at margins. I, you know, yeah. could, what, what, we're recharging in a price point that a retail store could double or triple. And, you know, and, yeah. and so I had all that stuff going on in my head because you have your yeah. old skill set and I brought it into my new skill set. And you can argue that that's true for every person who makes a, a pivot, that they take, they bring with them everything they learned in their previous. Yeah. That's, that's so iteration. true. I mean, I've, yeah, I think you're banging on, you're right on the money there because to be, you have to think of what you're good at because you have to think if you're going to make an entirely new pivot onto a new skill set that you don't know, that's actually a weakness of yours. You're just going to be frustrated and chances are you're going to fall off it. So you really have to focus on your strengths 
and dial in on those as much as possible. Maybe it's something you're naturally talented for that, or maybe it's something that you just have the most experience with. I heard one time uh, a mentor of mine told me, what was something that when you were five years old, you know, five, 10 years old, that people complimented you the most on? And chances are you have a really good skills to that. So maybe it's numbers, maybe it's reading, maybe it's, you know, some kind of other thing, but it's, you know, it's eventually the entrepreneurial journey is an interesting one because sometimes it's what well, we did in our nine to five, we got sick of that. And now we want to make it and turn it into our own. So usually if you can create some kind of pivot, whether you're in healthcare or accounting or whatever, um, and turn that into your own business, that's a really good place to start doing something that's parallel to what you're already doing. So literally all you have to do is just hop on over to the next lane and you'll just, you know, skyrocket something that's, that's your own. It could be perpendicular just with a similar, I mean, when you're, when you got a perpendicular, you still got a point of connection. Well, there you there's go. Still, too. There's, yeah. still, there's still a point of connection. Oh, well, hold on. That's not perpendicular. That's a square. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, wow. So I was just thinking about what was I really good at when I was a kid. And uh, the thing <laughs> that I was really good at was uh, I befriended people from all different like, you know, you had your cool kids uh-huh. and your jock kids and your yeah. nerdy kids and your drama kids and your band kids. I was friends yeah. with all of them. Wow. Right. That's I amazing. mean, I could be talking to the jocks and then turn around and yeah. talk to the nerds. Right. I, I Cause I, yeah. I was friends with all of them and that's my yeah. skill set. My skill set is that yeah. I can be comfortable with everybody and everybody's comfortable with me. I mean, so yeah, you were a social media. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, yeah. And, and, you know, I rarely <laughs> ever, I mean, of course, everybody has people that they don't like, and it's usually people who don't, people don't like me because I'm friends with everybody. Right. <laughs> you, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they're, you know, they just want to be in their zone. They don't like it when people are, <laughs> are outside of their comfort zone. And I've always been comfortable outside of my comfort zone. So um, what was your skill set when you were a kid? I love building things. Like I was obsessed with Lego and connects as like, so my parents thought I was going to be an engineer or something, but uh yeah, I mean, maybe that just kind of went into the math. Maybe just building things. Maybe it doesn't have to be engineering, but maybe just building a business. And I think like it was really interesting because later on, when I kind of left the nine to five world, I did a bunch of personality tests myself, like like five different of the top ones, whatever they're called. Um, and they all said I should be an entrepreneur. And when I did a genetic test on myself, like a very in depth genetic test, my genetics says that I should be an entrepreneur. And so I was doing this you know, nine to five, that wasn't calibrated to me. And this is another, I think, important lesson too, is run with, you know, what you're good at and like, what is, what is the match to you? And, you know, maybe it sounds woo woo, but it's like, what were you born on this earth to do in some way? Um, Like, what is your unique gift? And if you can really run with that, like, sometimes you just need to be silent and just let it come to you sometimes instead of forcing it, because sometimes we just get in our way and we just, we don't see it because our vision's so blurred, but some, you know, I, I, looking back, that whole sleep thing came to me when I was just sitting down looking at my ceiling or like looking outside and my mind just had time to process, like the subconscious mind is so powerful. Um, You just have to give it time to, you know, really work in your favor. And that's why sometimes people have the best ideas in the shower and something just pops into their head or something they dream about. It's just, you know, working your favor. A really cool book for that actually is called psycho cybernetics uh, by Maxwell Maltz. Um, It's incredible about subconscious mind. Definitely one of my top three, but uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's all, all along there. And um, yeah, so for me, it was just building things. And when you have that match and you run with it and you dedicate yourself hundred percent to it, you know, chances are good things are going to happen to it compared to most business owners, you know, maybe who fill a business, they have the marketing wrong. They don't have the drive. They expected a quick buck, but it didn't happen. They didn't stand it for the long term. It wasn't something they were truly passionate about or maybe built for. Um, and it's, and you look at it that way, it's like, well, no wonder, you know, just going through the grindstone every single day of something you're not passionate about, it's not going to work versus me. Like, I mean, it's cliche, but I never work a day in my life because it's so much fun looking at lab test kits, seeing people's results, making tweaks and changes. And, you know, they feel 30% better, you know, from month to month or something like that. It's, it's pretty profound. I want you to listen to what you just talked about. Lab tests, tweaks, all that thing. Those are all building blocks. You yeah. are still playing with kinetics and, and Legos. They're That's just, right, yeah. they're, it's just a different form. You're still yeah, putting things yeah. together. Put, you're still putting puzzles together. Yeah. That's awesome. You're, that you is, don't said that before. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to answer? Uh, you know, I think we really covered it all. Uh, we got pretty technical at some point. So maybe people want to do a re-listen, but really, you know, just focus on sleep, make it a priority for a month, see how you feel. I'm sure you'll be pretty surprised by the results. If you want just some free resources, you can go to my website. It's www.thesleep, so T-H-E, sleep, consultant, 
www.thinkandgrowthcoach.com. On side of there, you can, you'll see a pop-up when you first go to the page of a free questionnaire, um, just based on what the, you answer 10 questions based on those questions, I'll send you a direct uh, checklist that's specific to you that'll work the best for your biology in the best way possible. That's not a lab test, but it's actually still pretty good. Um, on side of there, I've got a bunch of blogs, free resources. People can also even schedule a free 15 minute sleep assessment with me where we just, you know, I'll provide as much value as I can. Obviously I have paid programs with the lab tests and everything, but if you just want to, you know, just get quick tips, um, changing your bedroom environment, changing your morning routine, evening routine, all that stuff, I can more than happy point you in the right direction. So what I've inspired to do based on this conversation is I'm going to wake up every morning and drink one glass of water. I'm going to do it for a week and see if I can add two, which means I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to make sure that my, because our water filter is cold water and cold Mm. water early in the morning is a little tough. So I'm going to have to make sure that I have room temperature water waiting for me when I wake up in the morning, which means my bedtime routine is going to include pouring a glass of water and making sure that it's there when I wake up in the morning. Yeah. And I, I mean, put a little lid on it so it doesn't get any dust in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good too. Another really quick one is go onto Amazon, look up water bottles and you can find those, you know, plastic ones, BPA free. They'll say, you know, 32 ounces on them with the measurement. And all you need to know is I need to drink this when I wake up. So it's not this guessing game, like of how much is it? It's just, I need to drink this and then that's it. And it just makes it a lot easier. I don't drink out of plastic. I don't like the way it makes the water taste, but I have 32 ounce uh, mason jars. So I have to yeah, fill a 32 ounce true. mason jar and put the lid on it and yeah. it's all good. I'm a, yeah. yes. I, glass, but... Yeah. I just, it, it's just, uh, and I don't drink out of stainless steel either because it makes my mouth feel funny. Mm. So God, yeah, I, yeah, sure. all of, all of my drinking glasses, all of my water bottles are glass. This is nice. actual glass. Yeah. Um, nice. it just, best way to you know, do it. Yeah. Um, okay. So now is my favorite part of the interview. You get to share your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Uh, my favorite moment of gratitude is, you know, I think, I think this thing I've gone through is at the time I hated, I thought, why me? Why was I the one that had to go through all these things, falling behind, falling, falling behind my friends and everything. It was in a, you know, it was in a a pretty dark place at the time, but looking back, it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me because it set me on this thing that I was probably truly passionate about. So for that, I'm very extremely grateful of just changing people's lives. Cause looking back, like I could probably still have just been in a cubicle right now, just working, you know, with spreadsheets and everything like that, thinking what could, what more could I have done? But, you know, people that I'm just very thankful for, it's just, you know, all the clients, all my mentors, my friends that supported me along the way. Um, I found I've had nothing but the best support through people. So for that, I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, anyone that's been negative, it's just, it's okay. I mean, they're just on their own journey and things like that, but, um, yeah, overall I feel it's just been positive and, I've just been extremely lucky to work with the right people and not make some of the mistakes that can, you know, cost a business to go out of business. So yeah, that's, I'd say that's everything there. Thanks for joining us this week. We're Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro influencer magic. Your time is valuable. And I am ever so grateful that you chose to spend your time with us today. Be sure to check the show notes at gratitudegeek.com episode 128 for links to all the groovy resources mentioned today. And of course, to connect with Riley Jarvis. And while you're there, why not subscribe to the show on Audible, iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast players. Our theme music is track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I've been your host, Candice Rodardi. Join me on my mission to spread gratitude. So seeds of appreciation and harvest a bounty of generosity and kindness. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends.